um, first things first, make sure you have your Bibles with you. Okay, so I want you all to have your Bibles in front of you right now <clears throat> and open throughout this whole thing because it's God's word that has the authority, not me. Uh, so I want you to always look into the Bible and we're going to be drawing from Ephesians 4. So if you could head over to Ephesians 4, open that up. Um, Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. So that'll be where I'll be um, yeah, drawing this sermon from this talk so make sure you keep that in front of you i'll read that out for us quickly now as we begin so ephesians 4 1 to 16 as a prisoner for the lord then i urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received be completely humble and gentle be patient bearing with one another in love Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Okay. <clears throat> Now, I wonder, have you ever looked at your pastor um, and wondered how did they end up doing this job? You, you heard a little bit about, you know, my journey in. I wonder if you ever looked at your pastor and thought that. I think for most of you, <clears throat> you probably see your pastor as some uh, super spiritual, extra holy, specially anointed person called to this hallowed role of full-time ministry. Wow, you know, full-time ministry. But let me tell you something. Um, I'm not very special. I'm a regular person like all of you, a sinner saved by grace to give all of my life to Jesus Christ as a living sacrifice. That's Romans 12, 1. But friends, that was my calling long before I became a pastor to give my whole life to Jesus because that's the calling for all of us, isn't it? Today, we're thinking about the topic of ministry, a word which means service. I don't know if you know that. Ministry means service. And I'm going to show you from God's word that each and every one of you is called to full-time ministry just as much as I am. You just don't realize it yet. Now, some of you might be getting scared at this point, but don't worry. It won't be that painful. Not much anyway, but do expect to be challenged. Not particularly by me, but by what scriptures have to say about this topic. Now, our main text that we'll be looking at here is Ephesians 4. Uh, there'll be three points that I'll be going through. Number one is know your calling. Uh, number two, is that we need to body build together. And number three is that maturity matters. So know your calling, body build together, and maturity matters. Um, but as we start, I'll give you a little bit of context to Ephesians. You might know it. You might, this might be the first time you've read it. I, Ephesians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Ephesian church, which is in modern day Turkey. Um, it's actually split into two halves. So chapter one to three is about the theology. It's about theology. So it's truths about God. So it's got the gospel. And chapters four to six, the second half of the book is about practice. What does this actually mean? How, do, how does this affect the way we live? So theology and practice. Um, so in one to three, Paul, the apostle Paul, he has revealed God's marvelous eternal plans of summing up all things in Christ. And the church is at the center of his plan and a new creation, a new united humanity. And chapter four, which we're actually reading here, the start of chapter four, it marks the transition point between his writings on theology to actually applying this in practice. This is where the rubber hits the road. What, what are we to do in light of this gospel truth? 
Well, let's keep your Bibles open and we're going to look at this. So know your calling. So Ephesians 4 verse 1. Have a look at verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, Paul here is he's in prison because he wouldn't stop proclaiming the gospel. He knows what it means to live for Jesus. He's got some authority to talk to us about this topic. And he says to the church, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, what is that calling? Well, it's essentially the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, but he sums it up in verse four. Have a look at verse four to six. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, did you notice one particular word that stood out as you read those verses? Um, one. Do you notice that? One. There's over and over. One, one, one. Oneness, unity in Jesus Christ. That's a calling for all Christians. I think one of the purposes of this is to, to unite us together because this is inherent to who we are as Christians, right? If you are a Christian, you are part of not two, but you're part of one body, multiple parts held together as one by the power of the one Holy Spirit. We all share one hope of eternal life for the future. We have one Lord, Jesus Christ. You have a shared faith in him. You have a shared baptism into his death and life. One baptism. We have one God and Father of all, which means we are all part of the one same family. One. That's what Paul wants to emphasize here. This amazing reality of unity in Christ is ours. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are bound, united, connected with every single other believer in Jesus. When you were rescued from sin and death and brought into salvation and life because of the gospel of Jesus, you are not saved to be alone, but to become part of a new people, a new family, a new church. Friends, what you need to really realize is that Christianity, it's not a solo sport. Maybe you've got a friend who says, um, you know, my Christian life, it's a private thing. It's a bit of a private thing. It's just between me and God. Or they might say, I, I like Jesus. I'm just not a fan of the church. Um, maybe that's even how you think and you're here today. And that's, that's how you think. Maybe your attitude to God is shaped by an individualistic framework, like our society so often pushes to us, where you do you and everyone else can worry about themselves. But can I just be really honest and clear on this fact? It's unbiblical. Yeah, there's no such thing as going solo in the Christian life, being an individual in the Christian life. Because inherent to your calling as a Christian is a calling for all Christians. This is a calling for all Christians. is the fact that you're no longer alone, but part of a new people united in Christ. Part of his church together. That's the key word, together. Friends, we have to start here. You need to know your calling. You need to realize who you are. This isn't an optional extra. This is your identity. Do you believe that? Here's the command. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. The question is how? Well, we're at point two, body build together. Now, every church has that one guy who spends like way too much time at the gym. You know, that really buff, muscly guy. Um, hands up if you have that guy in your church. Don't point him out. Don't say his name, but I'm sure there's always that one guy um, yeah, I know there's guys, much, there's heaps of guys who love building their bodies, you know, heading to the gym, but we're going to see a different type. <laughs> I think there's someone's calling someone out in the comments there. Hey, time. No, anyway, <laughs> but here we're going to see a different type of bodybuilding. All right. And one that's far more valuable. So have a look at verse seven with me. Verse seven. <clears throat> but to each one of us, Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now, it's a complex little part of Ephesians, which we don't have time to get too much into now, but... Um, as Paul talks about living out your calling, you know, remember who you are, live that out. 
he goes to this section talking about Jesus Christ. Verse 9 to 10 speaks of Christ as the king who humbles himself to come to this earth and die. But he then talks of him as the victorious, exalted king who was raised from the dead and ascended high into the heavens. And what does this victorious king do? Well, he gives gifts. His grace is given to us. Now, this isn't talking about saving grace here because all Christians have the same saving grace in Christ. What's being talked about here, for lack of a better word, is service grace, gifts to serve the church. And the context makes this clear. Have a look at verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So that the body of Christ may be built up this is the body building we're talking about here building the body of christ you see there's unity in the church we talk about the oneness we have in christ but there's also diversity in the church too he's given us all different gifts and different roles to play paul lists out some particular roles and note that they are all centered on the word Uh, there's the apostles and prophets here he's looking back to that unique witness of the apostles or prophets throughout history recorded for us in scriptures um you know, he's talking about that, that this foundation that we have on the apostles or the prophets. So um, just as a side point here, I, I believe this means that we aren't really supposed to be looking for more apostles and looking for more prophets nowadays because the foundation has been set. That's what he says in verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, you don't need to reset the foundation. Um, but Paul isn't just talking about historical word uh, ministries here, uh, but roles that continue on in the church. So there's apostles and prophets, but there's evangelists some gifted with unique gifts to proclaim the gospel. So important because we're here to tell people about the good news of Jesus. There's, there's pastors. There's those who have the responsibility to shepherd the flock. That's what the word pastor means, uh, to guide God's people, to keep them walking with Jesus. There's teachers. There's some, amongst you, some of you here, I'm sure, that you're teachers in your church. You're gifted to teach scriptures, explain the truths of the word. Um, this includes pastors, but it's not only them. Uh, lot, you know, your Bible study groups le- leaders, or, um, those who do teaching, Sunday school, all those things, all throughout the church, you know, there's teachers. <coughs> and this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but um, Paul outlines these guys, these particular roles, uh, these key people for a key purpose. So have a look at verse 12. The purpose is this, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up to equip his people for works of service so that the body of christ may be built up this is a key verse here friends we need to realize we're here to build the body of christ together each and every one of us i wonder if you see your pastor's job as doing all the ministry after all they're, they're being paid right it makes sense that they're, they're supposed to do the ministry I wonder if your pastor sees their job as that. Well, let me tell you that that's not the pastor's job. I see it as an incredible privilege to be a pastor, to teach and guide and care for people so that they can keep walking with Jesus. But let me tell you something. I'm not supposed to do this on my own. I'm not supposed to shoulder the burden of the spiritual life of each and every one of the 150 people in my church. Because guess what? I can't do it. I just can't. I can't do it on my own. And if I can speak on behalf of your pastors, they can't do it on their own either. And God knows that, which is why in verse 12 here it says that pastors, their key role is to equip the people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. This is the only way that the body of Christ is going to be built up. If everyone's equipped and everyone is serving, a pastor's job isn't to do all the ministry. It's to equip God's people to do the ministry. You see, God has designed his church so that every single member has a role to play in building the body. Did you realize that? Every single member. Every single member has a role in strengthening God's people, ministering to each other. Each and every one of you is in full-time ministry. You might just not realize it. And when we think like this, it's a paradigm shift. It changes the way we think about church. Now, I don't know if any of you commute to work, and I know COVID has really changed that situation for us. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
But what I really like about uh, in the past when I commuted on a train or bus is that I can just sit back and relax. I can have a sleep. I can play a game on my phone. I can read a book, whatever. I just trust the driver's going to get me to my destination and, you know, I just go along for the ride. Uh, so that's what I really love about commuting. But I wonder, is that how you see church? Maybe you're just there for the ride. The pastor's doing the driving, you know, he'll get you there. I don't have to worry. I can just relax. It's, it's comfortable, actually. I'm, I'm there. I can see my friends. Um, yeah, and I'll trust the pastor will get me to the destination. Well, the scriptures have a very different view in mind. You are part of a body. And if you remember back to high school anatomy, a body is made up of lots of different parts and they all need to function together for the body to be healthy. Every part, even the smallest one. Now, I enjoy playing um, a bit of touch footy. So I don't know if any of you guys play touch football, but my aging body hasn't coped so well over the years. I often get injured nowadays. Um, but there's one injury that really annoys me. It, and you guys might get this, you know, when you play other ball sports is when you jar your thumb, you know, like when the ball hits you right here and it just like jars your thumb when you catch a ball wrong or put the ball down awkwardly or whatever. Um, and if you've ever done that before, you realize uh, at that point, you realize how important your thumb is. You never realized it before, but then you realize how important it is. This one small part of the hand, if you can't use it, there's so much you can't do. You can't even pick things up properly. You can't write, you can't type properly. It's hard to even eat food. Uh, it's this little thing, uh, this little part of the body that impacts everything about the rest of the body. Can't gym, that's right. <laughs> Friends, every part of the body matters, no matter how small. Every part of the body has a purpose because God designed it like that. And that's how he's designed our church. You aren't here by accident. You have a role to play. That's how God's made his people. We are one body, different parts. We all have a role to play. So the first step is that we need to be willing. If we want to really live out this calling that we have, we need to be willing. It starts with a change of attitude. We are in a consumer, individualistic culture and church is not immune to that. Uh, my guess is that for most of us, uh, most of our churches who's had to shut their doors, most of us have had to shut our doors and move online. It's, it's sort of brought this out even more than ever. With church online, you can tune in whenever you want. You can wear whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want. Maybe you can even watch it later if you don't feel like watching it now because it's saved on YouTube or something. You don't have to talk to anyone. Uh, you can turn off your camera. You can pretend you're not there. You know, it, it sort of brought that out even more, this consumer mentality for church. Um, it's an easy trap to fall into. But let me remind you of something. Um, church, it's not about you. It's not about you. And this is something, even as a pastor, I need to keep reminding myself of every day. I can approach my job in a very selfish way, seeking uh, to do it for the affirmation of others or wanting to feel good about myself because guess what? Um, I think like that because I'm a sinner, a forgiven sinner, but a sinner nonetheless. Uh, what I need to keep reminding myself of is it's not about me. It's not about me. And I want you all to remember that. This is key. When you walk into church with this mindset that it's not about me, then that changes everything. It's hard because we're selfish inherently, but we need to remember that. And I'm, I'm going to get you guys to do something now. It's going to feel a little bit weird, but we're going to say that together. You can stay on mute. It's all right. Um, but we're going to say that together. We're going to say, it's not about me together because I want you to actually own that. All right. So on the count of three, let's try that. One, two, three. It's, it's not it's about, about me. me. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's not about you. It just isn't. It's about each other. It's about building the body. It's about God's glory as his church is built up and strengthened. Are you convinced of that? Friends, when you walk into church, when you go into church online, whatever you do, and you have that mindset, it's not about me, but it's about others. It changes everything. If you aren't convinced of this, look to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's Philippians 2, 6 to 8. We follow the servant king, which means we walk in his footsteps as servants. It's part of our DNA. It's part of who we are. We have been saved, not for the sake of ourselves, but for the sake of serving others for the glory of God. This is where we need to start. Pray that God would change your heart to really grasp that and to be more like Jesus just a little bit. This is where we need to start. The second step is to figure out which part of the body you are. Now, we are all called to be pastors, and that's okay. Um, How has God made you? What sort of gifts do you have? That's the question I ask. Um, Are you an extrovert? You know, for the extrovert, do you love talking? Do you love, you know, then make it your ministry to talk to people, to say hello to newcomers. That's so valuable. That's how God's made you. Um, But, you know, maybe talking to people is really hard for you. Maybe God's made you more of a behind the scenes sort of person, helping uh, the, you know, hosting team set up and clean up volunteering to help organize events. You've got good admin skills, maybe Um, those more behind the scenes things. Then use that for the sake of building the church up. Uh, Maybe you're not a good talker, but you're a good listener. Then listen to people as they share with you, pray for them, point them to God's word. Uh, If you're good at music, if you love kids, if you're creative, well, whatever that you have uh, gifts in, whatever you're good at, however God's made you, well, ask, ask your pastor how I can use this to serve the body. Um, it's a weird time with COVID-19 at the moment, but uh, it doesn't mean that we should stop serving. I think the danger is with COVID, if we're not physically seeing each other in church and many churches are starting soon, is that uh, we can sort of drop off and we're not serving anymore. But man, there's so much we can be doing because we don't cease to be the church just because we're not together physically. Um, Maybe it's just something like sending a message to someone and encouraging them, uh, asking them how they're going. How how can I pray for you? Um, What's what's uh, let me share with you something that I've been reading in the Bible. Yeah. A few guys in my church have started uh, just reading the Bible over zoom with each other. Just, you know, uh, sitting down, you know, regularly and just reading through a bit of scripture and talking and praying with each other, you know, just because they want to encourage us, bear each other on. There are all those little things that we can be doing. Um, but you just got to think about who you are and what your gifts are. If you don't know what you're good at, then maybe you can ask someone else. Uh, that's one practical thing to take away from this seminar. Ask a friend uh, after this seminar, what am I good at? Um, someone you trust. Okay. Yeah. Don't just do it to everyone. Yeah. So you can take the, the truth. You know, what am I good at? And how can I use it to serve the church? Find, find out your gifting, right? Because God's made us all different parts of the body. We're all going to be different, but we can all use it to build the body up. But also let me say something. You don't have to be a superstar to serve. Uh, there are things that we are all called to as Christians that, uh, yeah, that we have to do. Uh, there's no excuse. You can't say, um, actually, my gift, God hasn't gifted me in loving people. So I'm just not going to love people. That's just not really my thing. I don't, yeah. Love it. We're all called to do that because we're Christians and that's the way of Christ. Yeah. We can all say hello to each other. We can all pray for each other. We can all help mind the kids for parents in the creche. We're, we're, we can all do little things, even if we're not the best at them, because we're all called to love. It's all about figuring out how you can build this body together with everyone else. So friends, remember that, that think about the fact that you are part of the body, work out which part of the body you are and use it to build a church for God's glory. And there's a goal to all this bodybuilding and it's not just to look good on the beach. All right. Here's our final point. Maturity matters. Uh, Have a look at verse 13 with me. Verse 13. We are to build the body until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You see the goal here is maturity. It says here, mature manhood uh, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Um, We are to attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of God. Um, there's, there's actually a tension here 
the tension here. The fact that, you know, in one sense, uh, we have already been united in faith. Um, uh, we already know uh, knowledge of the Son of God, um, but we don't have the fullness of that yet. Uh, there is a day when Christ returns, when we will attain all these things in their glory, in their full glory, when we will know the full amazing reality of unity in Christ. But until then, uh, we, we need to remember we haven't arrived yet. Uh, so something I think we all need to remember is that don't ever think your Christian journey is over. I don't know if there's some of you here who've been Christians for like decades or whatnot. And you might think, oh, yep, yeah, I've reached that level. I'm, in, I'm a mature Christian now. Um, uh, that's a wrong way to think because we're all works in progress until Jesus Christ returns. Uh, we're all here to help each other keep maturing, keep maturing, keep maturing. Our goal is maturity, but we will never be perfected until Christ returns. You aren't a graduate of grace. Uh, you, you can't be a Christian long enough think, uh, to, to think that you've just got this whole faith thing just worked out back to front, that you've, you've got it all handled, uh, that you know Jesus well enough, that you're living out unity well enough. Let me tell you something. You haven't arrived at that destination yet, which is why it's so important for us to keep growing and help each other to keep growing to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ the image here is of the whole church growing up as one body to maturity maturity that we as a church reflect um, that we as a church can reflect jesus christ perfectly um, paul goes on to give a reason why we need to keep growing and maturing so have a look at verse 14 with me Verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every teaching and by this cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Um, here's the thing I can tell you because um, I've got four kids. I don't know, that didn't come out in my interview, but I've got four children. So it's uh, busy times at home. Uh, my youngest is one and a half. And one thing that I can tell you is that babies, they aren't mature. Babies are not mature. They can't do anything. Uh, they literally cannot do anything except for my baby, Jacob, my youngest. He can destroy things. That's what he's very good at. But other than that, he can do nothing. They're at the mercy of everyone else around them. Um, the picture here that Paul's talking about is it's almost ridiculous. It's a baby out in the sea being tossed around by the waves. Um, it would be ridiculous if it also didn't paint a frightening picture of danger and death. Can you imagine seeing a helpless baby who cannot do anything on their own, tossed about by crashing waves at the beach? And Paul says that if we don't grow up, if we don't help each other grow up, if we don't help each other and serve each other mature, that's what will happen to us. That deceitful people will come in and lead us away with false teaching that will be deceived by the things of this world that sound good, but they're actually sinful. It's so important for us. We need to help each other to grow up to mature. How do we do this? Well, verse 15, look at verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Instead of being tossed about like little babies, here's our other option. Speak the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love is how we grow together in maturity as a body of Jesus Christ. What is this truth? I don't believe this is, uh, some people, you, you, you might have used this first before, heard it before, just like, it's just any truth uh, that you're supposed to say in a loving way. Um, I think this can be nothing less than the truth. It has to be the gospel because this is the only truth that prevents us being led away by false teachers, being led away and deceived by the things of this world. The truth that all throughout this book Paul has been praying that we know better that Jesus Christ, because of his love that is so wide and high and deep and wide has died on the cross to pay the price for our rebellion against God. And that if we trust in him, that we can have eternal life and be part of a new family with God. And we get to call God our father. <laughs> what a privilege. This is the good news. This is the truth that we're to speak in love. And as we think about playing our part in maturing the body of Christ, speaking the truth of love, that has to be at the core of what we do. When you're thinking about the fact that you are in full-time ministry, what's that mean? Well, it means that we speak the truth in love to each other. This is God's way that he grows a church. 
This is just how he does it. Let me say something. If it's not gospel related, it won't build the body. I just put that out clearly. If it's not gospel related, it won't build the body. It won't mature the body because God has chosen to use the power of the gospel. The Holy Spirit works through the gospel to transform hearts and change hearts. That's just, what, that's just how he works. So speak the truth in love. We all have a role. This command isn't just to the word ministers, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists. The pro- it's to everyone. So how do you do that? How will you do that today? Perhaps you want to share something you've learned from this webinar to a friend, to each other. Maybe you want to share a reflection you've had from your daily Bible reading with someone. Maybe you'll listen to someone's issues and point them back to the love of Jesus Christ and pray for them as they struggle. Uh, maybe you'll meet up one-to-one with someone to just read the Bible together. That sounds scary, but you know what? It's not that hard. You just meet up together and read the Bible. It's okay. You won't get it perfect, but it's God's word will change your heart. It will change the person's heart that you're reading with. Um, After church, you know, when we meet together again, I don't know if you guys are meeting together again. So easy to talk about frivolous things in the week, but you can do that with anyone. You're God's people. You know, if, if, if that's, if there's one place that you can talk about your spiritual life and God's word and be encouraging each other in the gospel, it's got to be at church. So make use of those conversations. These things are not outrageous things for Christians to do, but we often don't do them because we're scared of being that weird, awkward Christian who sort of like spoils the party um, or we can't be bothered. We're just a bit lazy. But let me tell you something. If every one of us did our little bit in speaking the truth in love, it's going to have a massive impact on our churches. Think about it. Every single person here, how many people, the 54 people here, every single one of you made an effort to speak the truth in love to your church community I guarantee you, you will change your church. Instead of just being a little immature, little boy church that's playing around, wouldn't you love to see a mature, strong church able to make a massive impact on the world for the sake of Jesus? Is that what you want to see? Yeah. God has given his church as the hope of the world. We're to grow his church, to build his church, to be strong so that we can proclaim the gospel. But it all starts with each and every one of you. Walk in those doors, virtually or physically, to your church. Remember, it's not about me. And live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And we're going to see transformation happen. Um, Hello. I just want to ask, um, how have you overcome conflict between those in the church that are resistant to changing their attitude? Um, You mean changing their attitude in terms of serving one Um, another? I or guess just general. I think in general, but like specifically <clears throat> that could be it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me tell you, yeah. Uh, as a pastor, I'm often wrestling with this idea of um, being disappointed in people, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, and I think, yeah, there's a lot to reflect on in there because um, yeah, I think I have, an expectation of like, this is what I think people should be doing in terms of living out their life for Jesus. And when they don't meet that, then I'm disappointed in them. Uh, And that's quite difficult for me. Um, But I think I've had to really reflect on that and realize, um, yeah, like the Christian life is not performance based. Uh, I think we got to remember that that's what grace is. It's a free gift. Um, And it's not, it's not up to me really to, change people and persuade them through my um yeah i guess my persuasive words or you know telling them off or whatever which you know i can uh in my bad moments i could you know go towards uh but i think it really is just keep praying which i probably don't do enough of you know to be honest praying for people to change you know i'm probably spending too much time trying to change them uh but realizing it's only god that does the work so in short, I think uh, to overcome conflict, uh, prayer, very key. Seems like a cliche, very Sunday school answer, but bring it to God and pray about it because God's the one that changes heart, changes hearts. And I think a attitude in any conflict, I'm not sure exactly what sort of conflict you're talking about, but you know, in any conflict, the key thing is humility. 
Uh, and I think the, the problems come when, um, yeah, you sort of hold your position, a self-righteous sort of position above the other and think, look, they should be doing this, da, da, da. But those conflicts, you know, they, the only way they're defused is if you take the first step in humility towards the other person. Because I think that's how Christ, um, yeah, treats us. You know, he, he shows us that attitude of humility. So I think that's key. Um, yeah. Is that helpful, Cassie? Yes, that was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Iggy. Um, such good thoughts. And if I may yeah. add my two cents. <clears throat> sure, um, yeah. Patience in it as well is a thing that's important in that people take time to change sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes we don't see, uh, see change at all in years or however, however long it takes. And so to keep on being faithful, um, to take up our cross daily, to be patient with them and to keep on loving them is a good yeah. attitude to have, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, that fruit of the spirit, which I often need so much more of. <laughs> I'm not a very patient person, I think, but I'm always reminded by um, my, uh, my pastor friends who have been pastoring much longer than me that just be patient, you know, <laughs> just be patient. It takes years and years and years. Um, yeah. For, for, for change often. Yeah. It's God's work. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think Amos, type something here about burnout in ministry. Um, yeah, I think that's a really relevant topic uh, as we think about serving. So I obviously, as we look at Ephesians 4, there's a big call for us to be stepping up in our service. But there's some of you guys here who are probably um, doing like a million things in church. I'd assume like Laura is probably one of those people because she's hosting this thing. <laughs> um, Amos organized this thing. I assume... You know, there's, there's usually a core group, which, you know, out of good intentions is serving a lot, but there's a real danger of burnout. Um, I think uh, there's a few things to note here. Number one is acknowledging that we're human. So I think acknowledging that um, as we serve, we aren't God. Uh, we aren't Jesus. We are not supposed to be the Messiah. Uh, so we're, we're just human, right? So that means a few things. Number one, physically... It means we cannot keep operating at full pace without um, burning out. So we need to rest. And that's a good thing that God's made us to be finite creatures that need rest and we need to rejuvenate. And we don't have to feel guilty about that. That's something I struggle with. Um, we've all got different personality types. I'm quite a, quite a driven guy who does a lot, likes to be productive. And sometimes when I feel like I'm not doing anything, I feel guilty. Like, hey, I should be doing something. Like... I feel like I should be doing something for God or like, you know, I feel like I should be you know, finishing that thing I, I was supposed to do. Like, um, but there's, there's goodness in just resting and um, enjoying God's creation and rejuvenating uh, so that you can keep serving. I think we need to keep thinking about this idea of, uh, you know, how the oxygen mask demonstration on the airplane, what do they always tell you? Uh, please fit your own mask before attending to those around you. Because you're no good to anyone if you're passed out, right? Um, so if you want to keep serving, loving others, make sure you rest well. Uh, that because that acknowledges you're human. And the other thing we got to acknowledge about our humanness is that we're not sovereign, but God is. Um, so the more a big danger in the burnout sort of cultures that we keep pushing out. And trust me, I see this all the time because in pastor, in full time ministry world, um, normally guys who go into full time ministry, they they go hard. Um, and especially because the nature of the work is you're working for God. You just feel like you just shouldn't stop, right? You just keep going and going and going. Um, but I think actually there can be a unhelpful view of God in there and that um, without us, he can't do anything, which is untrue. He is sovereign. He's in control. And we need to keep remembering that the more we can actually do that. And I think that's what I've been able to learn over the years is to have a genuine trust that God's got this, you know, you put in your effort, but, you know, it's not all up to you. He's in control. He is sovereign. Um, and your, I guess your actions have to back that up. So you can't say, oh, I believe God is sovereign, but then you spend an extra 20 hours perfecting this thing, which was already good, you know, to, good to go. It sort of shows that 
yeah, maybe I'm not trusting in God, but I'm trusting in my own performance a bit too much. Yeah. So I think just keeping those things in mind that you're a finite human being, you need rest. And also that uh, God is sovereign. You aren't really keeping those things <laughs> in mind is really helpful. Um, yeah. And just listen to your body. You know, if you're feeling tired, don't feel bad about saying no. I've learned to trust me. Um, I've, I've learned to say no a long time ago uh, in your church. I don't know what it's like, um, but in churches I've been in the past, if you let on that, you want to serve, that will like work you to the bone, which is really unhelpful. <laughs> like the more things you sign up for, the holier you are. Do it, do it, do it. Especially in the Chinese church, if I can put that out there, that's often the culture because um, that's just what our, um, I guess the generation before us grew up with, that work culture. Um, just really, really unhelpful. So you have to be ready to just say no as well. When people ask you to do things, if you show enthusiasm, they'll ask you, be ready to say no and be okay with that because God's in control. Um, yeah. So everyone's got different capacity too. Don't compare yourself to others. My wife, for example, has a capacity a million times more than me. She's incredible. She raises four children. Um, she you know, barely sleeps and she runs the Sunday school ministry and she, she's fine. Whereas if I did that, I'd be dead, you know? So don't compare yourself to others. You all have different plate sizes, but you know, how about you use that wisely for the sake of serving the church? Yeah. Um, this is a big, sorry, Amos, I'm going quite long on this one. Another thing you can think about is, um, yeah, think about that. You got a plate. There's only so many things that can go on that plate before, you know, it's overfilled and everything falls off. Uh, maybe you need to take some other things off the plate so that you can put more on for the sake of serving God. Yeah. So maybe your, uh, your, your work hours are too, too big because you're trying to climb the corporate ladder or whatever you're trying to run, make as much money as you can in your business. Maybe you're, you know, you've got a hobby that's taking up all your time because you just love it. Sort of, maybe you need to take some of those other things off your plate so that you, for the sake of building the body, serving church more, sacrificing for that. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. No worries. I've got an anonymous question here. Oh, anonymous. Um, okay. Could you please <clears throat> explain a little bit more about what it means to love by speaking the truth to each other. Uh, you did share some practical things like yeah. sending <clears throat> each other texts to encourage or mm -hmm. share about devotions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So um, speaking the truth and love, I think, um, yeah, like I said, uh, I think this is talking about the truth, gospel truth. So I think there's a wider there's a wider sort of application, you know, elsewhere in scripture of obviously honesty and truthfulness being important, but I do think this is about gospel truth. Um, yeah. I, I think we just got to talk about the word more. And I think I've been con convinced, uh, reconvicted recently about uh, the fact that, you know, without God's word, nothing will happen. So as we think about encouraging each other to grow, um, we can do a lot of good things. And I mean, serving each other in practical ways, you know, cooking each other meals and helping each other when we need to move. Obviously that's all called for in God's word as well. Uh, but if we really want people to keep growing spiritually in, in their relation with God, we have to be talking about God's word. I think we've sort of lost that in our culture. We think it's a bit weird or uncool or awkward to talk about God's word. Like, you know, after church, everyone's like, Hey, did you, um, I don't know. What do people talk about now? What are young people talking about? Did you, uh, did you play that game? <laughs> or, <clears throat> or how about the NBA? You know, I'm an NBA fan. You know, do you see the Rockets game the other night? How good is that? Or you talk about the, the Netflix series that's on or the, the newest cafe down the street, you know, that's your go-to conversation. Why wouldn't you use that conversation to be like, Hey, can I share with you something cool that I read the other day? You know what I mean? I thought it was really encouraging. Um, just do that and ask people, hey, what have you been reading? Um, and I think it's about culture setting because um, I think that's not our culture in church. But imagine if when you walked into church, you knew that everyone was going to be talking about God's word. Like that would be showing, hey, I read something cool. Um, and then you'd be thinking, oh, hey, maybe I should be doing that too. Maybe I should be sharing it. Maybe I should be reading my Bible more so I can share with people more. Imagine a culture in your church where that was just a norm. That's what culture is. Um, but it's got to start somewhere. So that's why I think it starts with indiv individuals. Yeah. Uh, so I think speaking the truth and love is just speaking about, speaking about God's word. 
It involves so much. It involves rebuking as well, I think. I think that's a topic I'll talk about a little bit now because I think we're so scared of calling people out. <clears throat> um, I was reflecting about this with my um, pastoral team just this morning. Um, that sometimes in our desire to be really gracious, loving Christians, we're so scared to say anything to people that might offend them. Um, even if we see people who are making decisions which uh, are not gospel-centered, um, where we sort of affirm that sometimes and just go, oh, okay, it's okay. You know, they have the freedom to do that. But really, we don't even question the, oh, why did you decide to take that job, which means you can't ever come to church anymore? Or why did you decide to buy that one and a half million dollar house, which means that now everything you do, you're enslaved to that mortgage, you know, like uh, when you could have used that money, you know, like not saying those things are necessarily wrong, but we don't even question um, and help people think about how God's word might speak into that. Um, so, and there's aspects where uh, there's clear sin that we're scared to even go to because we don't want to be that person. But speaking the truth and love is bringing the word uh, to them and showing them that, Hey, actually, I think God's word doesn't actually uh, commend that sort of behavior. I'll, I'll have, you know, like um, I'm here, I think in this position because people have spoken the truth and love to me, but they've spoken about Jesus's lordship to me and saying, Hey, Jesus demands actually that you aren't to live like that anymore. You know, uh, who've actually called me out and rebuked me on things at different points in my life. I probably wouldn't be in ministry. I was a guy in church. Um, we used to joke that <laughs> it's quite funny, actually what me and one of my friends, we came to a youth group and we used to look at the leaders and we used to think to ourselves, man, we we'll just promise me. We'll never be like that. Okay. Look at those hardcore. They take things way too seriously. What's wrong with those guys? Um, both of us are now pastors. So God's got a sense of humor. Uh, but I used to be the guy that went to youth group uh, on Saturday night, our uh, uni, like, um, and then I used to go clubbing and drinking afterwards after Bible study, you know, <laughs> sort of thing. Um, so, but if it wasn't for people actually speaking the truth and love to me by showing me from God's word, look, this is, if Jesus is the Lord, then what does this mean? Then I might not even be here. So I think uh, we've got to be, if, not afraid to say the hard things as well. Um, but also it's just about encouragement in the gospel, keeping reminding people. I think we, sometimes we, we lose that. We are like, Oh yeah, we, we all know Jesus died on the cross for us, but you know, how good is it if we are just encouraging each, each other to keep remembering, you know, Jesus loves you. He died for your sins. Um, you know, let's keep living for him. You know, that's the sort of stuff we need to talk to each other about. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Um, there's a question. Laura, do you want me to just keep going with these? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Malcolm asks, how do we encourage participation when serving in the church while maintaining a level of competency and skill? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, I think uh, serving, I mean, there's certain, like I said, uh, there's certain things that we're all called to do. Um, and I, I don't think we need to be at this amazing level to be able to say hello to people in church which goes so far. Uh, I, th I think we underestimate the little things like a newcomer coming in and even just an awkward greeting from someone can make them feel at home. So I don't think we need to think too hard about that. But when it comes to like upfront ministries like music, for example, um, you know, you got to think about, are you really serving the church if you're playing every song out of key and re being really distracting? Um, no, like, there needs to be a level of uh, competency there to actually serve one another, to build each other up. I think that's where it comes with gifting, but also people we're, we're trained, we, we get trained in these things. So I don't know about your church, but um, a good church. And I think we, we, I'm still working on this better as well. Uh, we don't just put people into ministry roles, but we train them to do their role. Yeah. That's what we should be doing because we're here to equip each other. Right. Um, so I think there's a reality, no matter what you do in terms, in terms of formal role in church, you know, even if you're an usher at the door, you need to be taught how to do that well. How do you welcome people well? How do you make people feel at home? You know, how do you, um, you know, show people where the facility, what, whatever. Yeah, we need competency for that. But I, get, I think for all of us, as we think about the informal aspects of ministry, uh, let's just keep practicing. Uh, let's keep getting better at it. Let's help each other in it. You know, if you see someone... 
doing really unhelpful things as they welcome someone like, you know, um, like being like, this far away from their face and being like really awkward or something, then you just you might just want to tap them on the shoulder and go, Oh, maybe that's not so helpful. Uh, that's how we learn. Right. Um, yeah. So I think we definitely need a level of skill and competency in church, formal ministries and informally, we just keep learning, practicing, helping each other in that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. Question here. Uh, we have to look, uh, Sorry, I'm just reading. I'll, I'll read it out. Sorry, I'm showing it in my head. Uh, I liked how you mentioned both of us, how we have to look at what gifts we have been given, but also acknowledge that there are things that we are called to, even if we find it difficult. Unfortunately, personality often is an obstacle. Example, shyness and confidence for people to love and serve the body of Christ. How do we help people realize those difficulties are not excuses to not love and serve, but are obstacles to overcome and perhaps how to overcome too? Yep. Um, yeah, so I think people, we're all made differently. <clears throat> you all know there's people who, you know, are really, they love being up front, you know, it's really natural for, for most people. Um, like for, say for example, for me, public speaking, like, you know, I don't find that a hard thing. It seems quite natural to me. So uh, when I hear that for most people, it's like the worst thing in the world. I find that really hard to understand. Like I was like, it's, it's fine, you know, but I know for most people, it's like their worst fear, standing in front of people and talking, right? Uh, so we're all made differently. That's fine. Um, but yeah, uh, how do we, they're not excuses to not do the things that we're called to. Um, I don't know if there's a secret formula here. I think it's a deep conviction from scripture about what we're called to that actually pushes us and motivates us to try and overcome these obstacles. I think we need to really understand the why with everything in the Christian life, everything in life, actually, if we want to be motivated, um, we need to really understand the why we need to understand the purpose. It can't just be like, Hey, go do this. Um, you can't walk in church and go, Hey, shy people, stop being shy. Go talk to people because you have to like, no one's going to do that. Right. But if you actually say to them, Hey, your identity is that you're part of a body and God's put you here to actually help other people grow, which means that, um, you can actually have a little comment, even if there's a small conversation that can have a massive impact on, on someone near you. So I know it's hard. Um, but maybe this is why we can try to actually overcome it, you know? Um, so I think start with the why. I think that's where that gospel centered purpose has got to push us forward. That's the only thing that's going to fuel us. Uh, there's no secret recipe there. I, I was in a church in Sydney um, where there was a girl um, who was so shy, the shyest girl, but man, she would every week, she would go and have these awkward conversations with new people, like super, like, you know, that often would die very quickly, whatever. Uh, that was so encouraging, honestly, seeing her put herself out there. Uh, and I think those little things actually make a big difference. If you've ever gone to a new church, even just to visit and no one talks to you, you're never going back there again. But even if someone comes and talks to you, you know, that, especially if they're shy and awkward, you know, they're putting in effort. That means a lot, you know? So anyway, all right, here's another question. I started working full time after graduating for uni for almost seven months now. And sometimes I find it hard to serve in the church, especially in the context of full time after becoming a working adult. Most of my time and energy have been spent focusing on my work as a fresh grad. Would like to hear you on this. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. So I think the chat, the tension of work um, and uh, yeah, the rest of life obviously is a reality that we need to deal with. We pour so much time into work just because it's what we do most of the week. But I think when I think of, talk about full-time ministry, I'm not so much talking about the amount of hours we spend in church serving. I think it's just an attitude. And it's a general mindset. Um, you know, you might not be able to give 10 hours of your time to church every week, but it's all the little things. And it's, it's the fact that, and it's not just when we're there on Sunday, right? It's like during the week, it's, it can be, it can be a text message uh, to a younger Christian brother or sister to go, Hey, uh, how can I pray for you? You know, I've been thinking about you. Um, you know, send me a prayer point. I'll pray for you. Yeah. That's serving, right? That's, that's, that's building the body. You know, it can be um, a phone call to do people still phone call. I don't think they do, you know, they, your phones can make calls, but I know you guys don't do that. Um, you know, whatever, uh, <laughs> a zoom or <laughs> whatever it might be. Um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, so I think we need to get out of the mindset that it's a set amount of hours that we need to like sort of do 
in order to sort of meet that expectation. But it's more of an attitude that we're always serving. We're always, that's what it means to be in full-time ministry, right? You don't clock in and out. We're always serving. Always, it's little things, you know, different seasons, you'll be able to do more. Different seasons, you'll be able to, when, when, when you're a new parent with a baby, you're not going to be serving formally very much in church, but you can, you can still invite people over and you can uh, um, involve them in your parenting, share with them some of your struggles and you can uh, still encourage them uh, to keep thinking about how they're living as Christians and things like that. So I think it's an attitude, all the little things. My other thing to say here is um, don't let work become an idol. Let me just say the blunt, hard thing. And that's for all of us. Don't let work become an idol. I know there's expectations, especially on fresh grads. And this is not just to the person asking questions for everyone. Um, <clears throat> don't let work become an idol. People put expectations on you. Society's going to put pressure on you. Your boss will put pressure on you. Uh, Jesus is still your king, right? So how's that going to impact your, what you say yes and no to? I'm not saying it won't be hard. Uh, I'm not saying you're not going to pay for it sometimes when you don't get the promotion that the other person worked twice as hard for. Um, but everything's got a cost. I think. So we've got to think about um, what are we sacrificing? Are we sacrificing uh, Jesus and our service to him or are we sacrificing something else? Yep. So yeah, don't let work consume you. Don't let, don't let work be an idol. Remember Jesus is king. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, here's another question. How do we encourage more brothers and sisters in Christ to serve in church ministry? How do we manage time well between church ministry and personal priority issues? <clears throat> yeah. Um, you can refer them to this webinar. They can listen to it. <laughs> um, like I said, I think it all starts with the gospel. Start with the gospel. Why? I think we're... Um, we're so often we revert back to a workspace sort of practice of like the more we do, the holier we are and we should do this. We're very duty driven, especially in the Asian church. I find like it's very, it's part of our culture. We're very duty driven like that. We should do this. So if your pastor asks you to do it, you're like, okay, I know this is a good thing. I should do it. But we don't often think about the why I think we need to be fueled by that gospel reason that Jesus is Lord. Um, we are called to uh, build the body. We're called to bring people into the kingdom and that's going to glorify God. You know, that's got to drive us. That's the only thing. So the more we can encourage our brothers and sisters about this truth as well, the more that service will flow out of that. I think, you know, if we actually remind people about Jesus's call in their life, that he's King and that he saved you. Um, so what are we going to do about that? You know, what's, what's that mean for us? Service sort of flows out. Uh, managing time well between church ministry and personal priority issues. Um, yeah, I think this is just general life skills, isn't it? It's hard work. I've been, you know, working on this for a long time as well. Everyone's got different systems um, to do it. Uh, what matters is intentionality, I think. So we've got to be intentional. You won't, <clears throat> with anything in the Christian life, I think, with anything in life, you don't just, you don't just drift into it. You drift away from it. You don't drift into a better relationship with God. You don't drift into better Bible reading and prayer. You don't drift into a more passionate serving heart. You got to be intentional about it. So it means that with our time, we can't just, especially in COVID, you know, we might be at home maybe a little bit more. We can't just like every day we're like, Oh yeah, whatever. I'll just do whatever. Just be intentional, be intentional about it. Actually go plan out and go, okay, today, here's what I'd like to be doing, you know, or here's, here's a goal that I want to set, you know, set some goals. I think that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, I preached a sermon in church the other, um, near the start of the COVID season about redeeming our time. Um, and one of the things I talked about is something I use as a practical skill is, uh, is something I call the big three. Yeah. So every day I set a big three about the three most important things that I'm going to do that day. Cause we all got a big to-do list of random stuff that we need to do. And sometimes we just do the things that are the easiest and we go, Oh yeah, cool. I've achieved heaps. But when you have a big three, it forces you to actually go, well, what are the three most important things? If I only had to choose three, what would I do today? You know, and they could be, you know, anything. It could be, I'm going to message someone today to tell them, uh, um, to ask them how I can pray for them. And I'm going to pray for them. You know, it could be one of your big three. One of them could just be, I'm just going to read my Bible today. 
and spend a really good time just reflecting on it rather than just ticking it off the list and not thinking about it at all. Yeah. Um, so all those things. And then on your big three, there might be a personal issue that you need to deal with, you know, a health issue or like a relationship thing that you need to address. You know, I, I need to talk to this person and apologize for this, whatever it could be. But when you actually set some goals, it gives you some clarity about what's important and what's not. Uh, too often, I think we're just drifting around and not being intentional. Um, and I think our time's just way too precious for that. God's given us time. Let's use that well uh, in a way that honors him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, manage your time and use a diary, like use an electronic diary. I use my calendar. I use like Apple stuff. So it's all linked. I just use my calendar for everything. If it's not in the calendar, it's not happening essentially. Like we need to do that because we are four kids. We all got different schedules and stuff like that, but use a calendar, honestly, like a diary and schedule things in and make it happen. Like stick to it. Yeah. Uh, as much as you can, it takes time. You won't get it perfect, but it's about intentionality. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So Henry says everywhere can be a place of ministry. Yes, I agree. Good. Uh, there's a question. What would you do when you try to gently correct someone to do what glorifies God, but they aren't receptive? What is a good way to be patient? Also, is there an extreme point at which they might need to be excommunicated? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, once again, no secret formulas here in terms of patience. We just have to be patient. Um, you know, if you show someone God's word uh, and they're not receptive to it, um, I think scripture sort of uh, commends a stepwise process uh, to, you know, personally approaching, uh, then bringing someone else along and then involving the wider church. Um, and then at that point, uh, there might be, a, you know, excommunication for lack of a better word. It sounds quite harsh, doesn't it? But that, that idea of being cut off from the rest. Um, but I think important to note from scriptures when it talks about that, it's always with the intent that you might, uh, it says treat them as an unbeliever. And I believe that means don't shun them and shame them because that's not how you treat unbelievers, is it? Uh, I think it means that you try to speak the gospel to them and restore them and bring them back into relationship with the church. Yeah. So that's an ext at extreme point where they're completely unrepentant. Um, and obviously this is uh, in consult. This is a decision for the pastoral leadership to make and a hard uh, decision not to be taken lightly. Maybe there is that element of excommunication, but it's always uh, treating them as an unbeliever in terms of speaking the gospel to them, seeking to bring them back so that they actually live with Jesus Christ as Lord and savior, not shunning them and shaming them. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this, this happens. People won't respond all the time. Um, but once again, it's about trusting God and praying for that. Yeah. If I may follow on on that. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that sometimes in rebuke or in things that we see, we don't even question the stuff. Um, how do we start to question if the thing that we kind of want to rebuke is not, it's not super clear whether it's, you know, they're doing something wrong. Yeah. How do yeah. we start to question it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, it's tricky. Um, I think you just ask the question, you know, <laughs> you, you can just go, I mean, classic example is um, when people buy stuff, right. Um, you know, I'm not going to call anyone out here. I don't know you guys, but say if someone just like bought like a super expensive car, um, usually our first response is like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, great. You know, or, you know, if you want to spiritualize it, you might be like, oh, that's such a blessing, you know, that, but really, you know, deep down there's a whole, you know, and I think rightfully so there's a bunch of us who are also thinking, oh, that's a lot of money. You know, why did that person spend that amount? Is it, you know, and we, we fear being judgmental. I think we're really scared of being seen as judgmental, but I think, if we never ask the question, then it just keeps affirming what the rest of culture says is right and good. Um, and I actually believe, I was talking to the team about this. I actually believe there's a whole bunch of people in our church who are making decisions, which they sort of feel like, Oh, I'm not sure if this is God honoring, but because no one ever talks to them about it, they're like, Oh, it must be okay. You know, 
because in this community, no one has actually said anything to me about it. So it must be all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it, it could just be a, uh, like, I don't know the exact way to do it. It could just be a like, Oh, just wondering what was, um, yeah. Why you decided to buy this car sort of thing. Um, you know, what's, what's the reason I'm, I've, I've heard recently that just asking why is not a helpful thing because it's quite, it can be a bit aggressive, but maybe you just want to ask, you know, what's, what's the reason? I'm just wondering what the reason it was that you decided to, to do that. Um, you know, how did you, or maybe asking people how they thought through it. Um, you know, how did you make that decision on that? I was just, I'm just curious, how did you make that decision? And if it's, uh, if you, and if something comes out, you might go, Oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's the right motivation, you know, if they go, Oh yeah, I just wanted to impress people. Then you're not just going to go, Oh cool. Okay. You know, like you, you would say something there to go, Oh, I'm not sure if that's what Jesus uh, actually calls us to as the important thing, you know, the affirmation of men and you know, things like that. Uh, so that's just an example, but yeah, I think it's just starting that conversation and asking the reasons, maybe asking how they thought through that. Um, a lot of it's getting back to the why and help people think through that with intentionality. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't want to go overboard and be like questioning every single thing that every single person does. Um, I don't think that's helpful, but I think, yeah, we're probably down the other end of not saying enough. Yeah. If I may ask one more follow up question. Yeah, of course. That. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, I guess, if we, uh, you know, we, we hang around the people that we are like, and maybe the culture that we're around, um, the, the people that we hang around are also more alike in culture. Yep. And those who are kind of, what if we're not close with the people that we want to say this stuff yep. to? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a hard one, because I think relationship obviously is important uh, that trust and relationship that we have. Um, I think if they call themselves a Christian though, you have a ground to ask the question uh, because of that. Once again, it's, it's that common uh, it's, it's God's word setting the standard for us, I guess. So if they do call themselves a Christian, um, then I think there is more of a ground for you to actually engage in that conversation. Uh, although, yeah, I'm just not sure how receptive that would be obviously if you don't have that trust and relationship with them, I don't know if there's an easy solution to that one, unfortunately. Um, but if you do think it's genuinely something that needs to uh, be addressed and maybe you want to give it a try anyway and make, and I guess it's your manner that really matters that you approach with a humble sort of, you don't approach with a self-righteous sort of judgmental, like, Hey, I'm here as a good Christian uh, to tell you what you've done wrong or to question your motives. Uh, it is uh, genuine, you know, I'm going to, I'm saying this out of love. Yeah. You know, I, it's different for me because I'm a pastor, but oftentimes when I say hard things to people, I will preface it by saying, I'm saying this, I'm going to say this because I love you and I care about you. And that's the reason I'm going to say this. And it's going to be, it's going to be uncomfortable, but I'm saying this because I love you. Yeah. And care about you. Otherwise I wouldn't bother doing this. Yeah. So sometimes people just need to hear that explicitly, I think. Yeah.